Good morning again. We're going to finish up Nehemiah today, so I'm going to read the 13th chapter, and then I'll pray, and then we will open up God's Word. Nehemiah 13, and we'll start at uh, verse 4, and um, I've entitled our time today, uh, The Not-So-Happy Ending That Only Jesus Can Fix. And I want you to pay attention to how the book of Nehemiah ends. It really would have been nice for it to have ended last week on a high note when God's people could make those promises and those vows to the Lord and that they could keep them and they could celebrate and have joy in the city and we would ride on the sunset. And it just doesn't quite end that way. Like many books of the Bible, you, like Zach mentioned earlier, they don't just end with this neatly packaged bow with God's people having it all together. They often end when things aren't together. And I think there's a reason. So let's attend our hearts to the word of the Lord. Nehemiah 13, we're starting in verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of the grain, the wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, to the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests, while this was taking place, I, this is Nehemiah speaking, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went back to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king, and I came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the court of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. And then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers. And I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. And so I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and I set them in their stations. And then all of Judah brought the tithe of the grain, the wine, the oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses, Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, Padiah of the Levites, and as their assistant, Hanan, the son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. And in those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them onto donkeys, and also wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. And then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing that you were doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates so that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. And then the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and I said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. You should laugh right there. <laughs> From that time on, they did not come on to the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this, is all, remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. And in those days, I also saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. 
and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not even speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them, and I cursed them, and I beat some of them, and I pulled out their hair. And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on an account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made him even to sin. Shall we then listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And there's nothing wrong with foreign wives. These were wives who did not love the Lord. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. And therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And thus I cleanse them from everything foreign, and I establish the duties of the priests and the Levites each in his work, and I provide it for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we turn to your word now and pray that you would speak through your servant. We do ask that you would enlighten our eyes, that we would behold the marvelous things from your law. How can a man or woman, son or daughter, keep his way pure by meditating upon the law of the Lord? Father, I do pray that you would meet us by your spirit and that you would change us with an encounter with the living God. Would you do this for the glory and honor and for the namesake of Jesus? Amen. So we're going to uh, finish up Nehemiah this morning. And if you've watched any movie then you probably know the, the, the common thread or layout of every movie. And I'll go ahead and disclose it. Uh, all movies, whether you're talking about Disney or Pixar or something really serious, uh, they, they all start the same way, right? You meet the protagonist, you meet the antagonist, you meet the hero, you meet the villain, and somehow there's a problem that needs to be worked on. And you know that the, the, the movie will move in such a way as to bring resolution to that problem. And then the hero will be standing, the villain will be dead, or the problem will be solved, and the credits will roll, right? And so this kind of works if you're talking about E.T. I don't know if you remember E.T. I, I kind of grew up, I loved E.T. But, you know, the problem is exposed early in the movie. This alien thing is stuck on Earth, and his parents have left him. And so he's, he's kind of, he comes under the care of these kids, and the entire movie, it plays itself out with trying to get E.T. home, E.T. phone home. That's kind of a classic line in the movie, and you know the movie is over when E.T. walks back on his spaceship and he sails away. And so what the author has done is he's brought closure to the movie by resolving the conflict, and the, most movies end with this whole idea of, and they lived happily ever after, Right? The conflict was resolved and they lived happily ever after. Now, when you read Nehemiah chapter, what we read last week, we ended at Nehemiah 13 verse 3. And I wish that this book had ended right there, right? That, that was the happily ever after ending that I think we all had hoped for. That when you read Nehemiah up to verse, uh, verse 3 of chapter 13, it really ends on this high note, right? It ends with God's people. Where are they? Back in God's land. And the temple was working. The wall is built. The people have moved out to the city, out of, into the villages to raise crops. The priests and the Levites and the gatekeepers and the singers, they've moved into the city to manage the house of God. And, it, and they have made this vow to obey the law of the Lord in its entirety, right? And they put together this plan. And when you read Nehemiah uh, 11 and 12, it, it, it really reads as if that is when the book should end. And it doesn't. It ends with the passage that we're reading this morning. And it ends on a low note that if you've watched other movies, I, I think the, the, a way to look at Nehemiah and the way it's ending, it's almost like a post credit scene is snuck in by the director. In other words, you get to Nehemiah 12 or Nehemiah uh, 10, 11 and 12, and it ends on a high note. Right. 
and then the credits roll, and then as you're walking out of the movie theater, the director drops one more scene. And why does he do that? He lets you know, or she's letting you know, that it's really not over. It's gonna be a part two. There you go, Mom. It's gonna be a part two, right? Now, whether it's you know, watching Marvel and you see at the end of it, the credits roll, when you see Thor's hammer, and then the next thing that they put out is the movie on Thor, right? Or it's, it's, it's uh, Star Wars, where the movie ends and the credits roll, and then right after that, you see little Obi-Wan Kenobi and you see Dark Vader, a shadow. It's letting you know that this is not over that that is the way Nehemiah is ending. The credits would roll in Nehemiah 10, 11, and 12, and then God sneaks in this last scene and says, wait a minute, it does not end on a high note. There is more to the story, there is more to it. And the case that I wanna sort of make to you this morning is the reason why Nehemiah ends on a low note. It's because Nehemiah isn't the ultimate savior of God's people. And the city that he's building isn't the ultimate city. And the wall that he's building isn't their ultimate security. And the high priest who is a corrupt high priest in this book, he isn't their ultimate priest. That what we're going to see is that man's condition is so bad that man cannot save man and fix it. God himself says, I will send my son 400 years after Nehemiah is written. Think about that, that I know in our English Bibles, my, my Nehemiah in my Bible, it's like right here. And so I got all of this Old Testament that goes all to about right here, right? And so when I read my English Bible, it does not read as if Nehemiah is the springboard into the New Testament. But in the Hebrew Bible, if you were to look at the Hebrew Bible order, you have Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles, which is a recounting. It's a history of the entire Old Testament. And then you would read right into Matthew. It's as if God is saying, Nehemiah can't fix the mess that the world is in. Nehemiah can't fix and bring in the city of God. God Almighty himself will have to come in the form of his son, and his son will be the center of the Bible. He will be the center of history. He will be the one who will fix God's people forever. And you get that if you were to read it with the Hebrew lens on. So what I want to do today is sort of show the, their need for a new obedience their need for a new leader or new leaders. And it, I want to culminate with, and that's only found in Jesus. And so you may not be a Christian here this morning, and you may not be able to orient yourself into the story of God. And you may think certain things about how Christianity works, but here's what God has done. He has snuck in something on us. He has basically put this ending right here this way so that we will definitively know that only God can fix us and only God can save us. Only God can clean us. Only God can keep us. And that is the center of the gospel. The center of the gospel is that God himself will fix God's people. God himself will take away their guilt. God himself is their security. God himself is building for them a city that all roads lead back to the throne of God and not the throne of man and not the throne of yourself. It leads back to Jesus. So what I want to do is sort of unpack their need for a, a, a new heart, a new obedience. And so here's what I'm going to do. If you missed last week's sermon, then I feel inclined to catch you up to speed because I think it fits perfectly with today. And I'm going to do it through a slide in a second, not right now. So if you were with us last week, we read Nehemiah 10. And in Nehemiah chapter 10, they've read the law of the Lord. They've read the word in the same word that they had confessed. They had now repented of through their sin. And now they endeavor, right? They, 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 they said, we enter into a curse and an oath to keep all of the law of the Lord. And so then they flush out, in what ways will you obey? They said, all of it. Well, well, well in what ways? The first thing we, they said we will not do, we will not intermarry with the nations. Again, this is not a black or white or a foreign and international cross-racial marriage. That is not what they're forbidding. They are forbidding marrying outside of the faith. 
And so what they had said is we will not intermarry with people who don't worship our God. That's the first thing. The second thing they said they would do is we will not dishonor the Sabbath day. In other words, they said we will not buy grain or buy food on the day that you've called us to rest. The third thing they said that they will not do is we will not get crops in the Sabbath year. In other words, if they weren't just on a seven day cycle, they were on a seven year cycle. And in the seventh year, it was to be a Sabbath just like the seventh day. And so they pledged to the Lord, we will not harvest our crops in the seventh year. And then they also said, and we will devote ourselves to the house of God. In chapter 10, verses 32 through 39, every single verse is about the house of God. Matter of fact, chapter 10, verse 39, it ends with we will not neglect the house of God, right? That's the four things that they said in a covenant and an oath. If we keep this, then save us. If we don't keep it, then you kill us. Like that is the seriousness of this covenant and oath that they had entered into with their God. And when you get to the very next chapter, you want to know what happens? Every single thing that they had promised with covenant and oath to do, they did not do. And here's what Nehemiah does. In his day, they didn't have highlighters and they didn't change the font colors to kind of make things kind of pop. You know, if you want to read a book and you highlight it, then that, that tells you this part is important. They didn't really do that. But what they did do is they used this uh, technique. And here's what they would do. It, it, it's a chiastic structure. I'm not doing this to show I'm smart. I promise you I'm not. But when I was reading it, it was like, bam, it just jumped off the page. So here's what I want to show it to you, right? Thank you for the slide. All right. So Nehemiah 10, they vowed to obey. In Nehemiah 11 and 12, they planned their obedience. So it wasn't enough to say we will not marry uh, foreign wives. They actually says we will not marry and we will withdraw ourselves from them. It wasn't enough to say that we will uh, not work on the Sabbath day. Well, how will you not work on the Sabbath day? We're going to put 172 gatekeepers up to watch us on the Sabbath day so that they keep us from selling and buying. It wasn't enough to say that we will forego the Sabbath year. Well, how will you eat in the seventh year if you can't harvest? Well, here's what they did. They said 90 percent of you will go out and live in the villages and you will raise crops. And the 90 percent of you who are raising crops, you will tithe. Your regular tithe will be brought into the storehouse and it will be kept there so that when the seventh year comes, we have six years of you giving and tithing and we have food in the seventh year. And, and then they say, well, how will we care for the house of God? We're going to move 10 percent. So 90 percent go in the fields. 10% move into the city. The priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, all of them would move into the city. So their obedience, it wasn't just lip service. They actually thought through how we will obey down to the detail, right? And in Nehemiah 11 and 12, you see this celebration. They did it. And here's what you see. So look, you see the A at the top, A, you see 1030, and go to the bottom. You say A, A4. You see 13, 23, 230. So here's the thing. Look how it's moving in. And so notice the order. The first thing they said they would not do is intermarry, right? The second thing they said they would not do is buy on the Sabbath. The third thing they said they would not do is forego the tithes. The fourth thing they said they would not do was, was abandon the house of the Lord. And look how Nehemiah 13 is written. It starts to unravel. What's the first thing they do? The house of the Lord. What's the second thing that they don't do? They don't give their tithes to the Levites. What's the third thing that they don't do? They, they, they work on the Sabbath. And what's the fourth thing that they don't do? They don't keep themselves pure from the nations. If you were reading this as a Hebrew and you saw this, you would be thinking like, dang, like every single thing they said that they were going to do. Matter of fact, Nehemiah puts it in order. He puts it in order to show you the reverse order. Chapter 13 is reverse of chapter 10, as if to say they did not keep down one of those commandments, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Noun one, right? Not one commandment did they keep. He makes the case that they broke 
every single commandment. And so I look at that, I'm thinking like, man, how could they? And then I look at our own hearts, right? How many times have you vowed that I'm going to take care of my body? I'm going to get sleep. I'm not going to watch as much TV and I'm going to eat healthy and I'm going to stimulate my mind with reading as opposed to digesting stuff, right? And then how many times have leaving work and Wendy's just looks appealing, right? <laughs> and that same little place in the couch where you sit, it has the indention because that's kind of, you know, I, I'm talking to myself, right? How many times have you said I'm going to stick to a budget and no more impulsive buying and you go to TJ Maxx or you go to Marshall's or wherever you go and that is your kryptonite, right? And you go in there, I'm only looking, I'm only looking, and before you know it, you're buying stuff, right? How many times have you said, I will not lust and I will not struggle, I will make a covenant with my eyes not to look, and then all it takes is a beautiful or handsome person to come around and your mind starts to wonder, right? That we are just like them, that we make these vows over and over again. We pledge to be more involved in the church and we're gone every weekend, right? I'm just being really honest, like I see me in them. I see vows that I've made. I've seen things that I've said I would not do. And you give me a day, right? It's as if God is saying, what? Your intentions can be good. Your knowledge of the law can be good. Your plans to obey can be good. But we lack a power right here to do it on our own. And that's why Paul could say in Romans 7 that this good thing that I desire to do, I don't do it. And this evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. And what is going on in me? He says that there is nothing good that dwells in my flesh. Who will save me is Jesus Christ himself. But the point of the matter is they cannot and will not render unto the Lord the obedience that they are pledging because something is wrong with their heart. It is fundamentally divided and skewed and sick. And what Nehemiah is showing us is that no human can give this obedience that God demands. On our best day, we are still double-minded. He is showing that they just made this vow and one chapter later, it's done. Second thing we see is that they, they need new leadership. And I want to start with this, this. I want to look at two people here specifically, Eliashib and Nehemiah. But they, they need this, this new leader. And, and he, he, here's something I want you to think about in the Old Testament. That God's, it's the way that God designed it, right? And I don't know why he's doing it this way, but he designed it in such a way that that God's people tend to thrive where there is good leadership. And where there is bad leadership, they tend to not thrive. Now, this is true with Moses. When Moses delivers them with, by God's mighty hand and outstretched arm, he brings them out, right? And then he goes up on a mountain and he is gone. And what happens when he is gone for 40 days, right? What, what's happening with the people down there when their deliverer is not down there, right? They make golden calves and they make idols and bow down. What's happening with them when they are during the period of the judges? Whenever they have a good judge, they're thriving. When they don't have a judge, they're failing. What happens to them when they are scared of the Philistines? God sends up one man, David, and David fights and they're well. And then David dies and things fall apart. That like it or not, the scriptures move in such a way that when there is strong, good leadership, the people flourish under that leadership. And when there's bad leadership, they crash. That, that, that's just kind of how the, the Bible is moving. And so here's the thing. When you look at Eliashib in this text, I want you to look at who he is. And you see, you get a glimpse of who he is and his significance. Look at verse 4 of chapter 13. Now, before this, Eliashib the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God. So that's the first thing. So he's the priest 
And so all the tithes would come into Jerusalem and would come into the house of the Lord. And Eliashib was the priest who made sure that the tithes were collected and that they were given to who they needed to be given to. And he monitored the inventory level so that in the seventh year we got enough food. This guy has a really serious job because if you mess this up, dude, we don't eat in seven years. Right. But he wasn't just this spiritual authority. I mean, this physical authority, this guy who took care of what they needed physically. Look at what you see in verse 13. I mean, chapter chapter 13, verse 28. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest. And so now you see that he's, he's wearing two hats. He's the guy who's managing inventory and taking tithes and taking offerings and is supposed to be giving it out to the people and, and rationing out accordingly. And he's the high priest. Which means that he's over their spiritual intercession. He's the one who goes into the holiest of holies. He's the one who makes sure that they're ceremonially clean. He's the one who intercedes and offers offers sin, offer sacrifices for his sins and then for the sins of the people. Like this is a really, really, really big deal. And here's the thing. His name means. The Lord restores. And what you see right here, he does not live up to his name. You see it right here. What did he do in verse five? He prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels and the tithes of grain, the wine and the oil, which were given by commandments to the Levites, the singers and the gatekeepers and the contributions for the priests. You hear what's happening? He cut a side deal with a guy named Tobiah and basically emptied out the storerooms and let Tobiah turn it into a man cave, right? So when Nehemiah comes back, he says, I emptied the household furniture. So he put something that was sacred out and moved something that was secular in. And so that's what he's doing with Tobiah. He's cutting his side deal, and that's not it. Look at what it says about him at the end. That his son, his grandson, had married Sanballat, the Horonite. Now, if you're new, those two names ought to ring a bell. These were Nehemiah's enemies. Throughout the entire book of Nehemiah, it was Sanballat and Tobiah who wanted to kill Nehemiah. It was Sanballat and Tobiah who tried to trick him and scare him and get him off the wall. It was Sanballat and Tobiah who were delighting in the suffering when they were in a famine. It was those two dudes. They, they are rejoicing when people are starving. Like this is how dark and evil they are. And here's the thing. They are both connected to the high priest. Can you imagine what it was like to be in Israel on this day? When your high priest is off the post, he's not doing his job. He's not offering intercession for you. He's not storing up crops and grain. It makes so much sense that you know what the fallout is? Look at the fallout of this. Look at verse 10. And I found that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who did the work of the temple, they each fled to his field. Do you see the fallout? A corrupt high priest makes a side deal with their enemies and the Levites and singers and the priests who normally work in the temple, who should be caring for the temple. They had to leave and go back to the field. And there's the fallout. The temple is crumbling. And you know what? This is the last high priest mentioned in the Old Testament. In other words, as you're reading this as a Jew, this is your last picture of what a high priest does. And he is corrupt. And he is crooked. They need a new priest. They need a priest who won't take a bribe. They need a priest who will make intercession for sin. They need a priest who will give them what they need. They need a priest who will preserve the worship of the Lord. They need a priest who can bring them into the very presence of God, clean and undefiled. Like they need a priest to go between them and they don't have it in their high priest. You look at Nehemiah, there's this other theme again. When Nehemiah is there, things are well. When Nehemiah is away, things are bad. Think about how Nehemiah began, that the city was in 
humiliation. The wall was torn. The, the people were just embarrassed. And Nehemiah is over here in Susa that he hears about the condition and then he leaves. And the Bible paints this picture that when this man gets here, he surveys the city. That's the first thing he does. He puts together a plan. He encourages the people. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That he stands toe to toe with their enemies, Sanballat and Geshem and Tobiah. As a matter of fact, it's beautiful here because those three men don't come up again. I mean, you see them when Nehemiah stands against them that one last time back when they tried to get him off the wall in Nehemiah 6 and 7. You know, they don't come up ever again in this book until this last chapter. And you know why they came up in the last chapter? Because Nehemiah was gone. They wouldn't come back around when he was there. But as soon as he left, look at what it says in verse six. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went back to the king. And then after some time, I asked leave of the king and I came back to Jerusalem. And then I discovered, in other words, when Nehemiah left in Nehemiah 2, he went on loan. That his first conversation with his boss was, hey, can I go to Jerusalem? Artaxerxes asked him, well, how long? And Nehemiah says his wife was there. And once I told him a time, then he let me go. And now we see that he was reigning governor for 12 years. And then he went back. And it was when he went back that the people went wild. It was when he went back that their enemies came out of the closet. In other words, do you see what the Bible is saying? That when he was there, they were good. And when he was gone, they were not. And here's the thing, when you read Nehemiah, it literally reads as if the burden for fixing them is on his back, right? So the, the, the phrase that's repeated over and over and over again, it's I. It's I. Now, 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 now follow it with me. Look at verse 7. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done. Look at verse 8. And then I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Look at verse 9. Then I gave the orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God. Look at verse 10. And I found out the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So look at verse 11. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together that I, 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 this whole book is about I, 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 what Nehemiah is doing. When I saw them marrying foreign women, I put my hands on them and beat them. When I saw that they were not watching the gates, I told them to get off and I'm putting my own men on the gates. In other words, Nehemiah is looking just like I am right now. He is sweating and he is tired. He is doing it all. And here's the thing, and you know this about human leadership. We can't be in two places at one time. You know, good leaders will die. And so for Nehemiah to have this burden for keeping and preserving and protecting and confronting and building and challenging and running off enemies. Here's the thing. He ain't strong enough to do it. He's going to die. And Israel is going to fall right back into their pattern. That is why he is exhausted by the end of this book. Oh, my God. Look, look, look. Oh, my God. I, I, I. And here's the thing. God is preparing us for the person who will come. Whose back is strong enough to fix. Whose back is wide enough to hold. Whose hands are firm enough to fight who does not die. And here's the thing that we are getting set up 
through this right here, through this Nehemiah who can't hold it all together, who can't be eternal, through this Eliashib who is a crooked high priest, it's making a way for the real high priest. It's making the way for the real one who can build, who can build a city that will last forever. It's making a way for the real one who can protect his people from all of their enemies. It's making a way for the real one who will come and who will defeat all of their enemies, who will defeat defeat sin, who would defeat death, and who will triumph over Satan once and for all. It's making a way for a new leader who will offer to his father a new obedience, and his name is Jesus. That the reason this ends so bad is because the gospel is so good. It's ending so low for humanity because humanity is in a condition that only God himself can fix. It's making a way for the better Nehemiah. It's making a way for the better temple. It's making a way for the better city. It's making the way for the better obedience that Jesus himself will render to the Father. That's why so much of Jesus' ministry is attached to this idea of new. Have you thought about it? When he had his last meal with his disciples, He took a piece of bread and he took wine and he broke it. And he says, this is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood, which is given for the forgiveness of sins. Why would he say this is the new covenant? Because he knew, he knew the new covenant that God would make with Israel. It was so much bigger than the old. The new covenant, God says, I will write my law upon your heart and you will want to obey me. The new covenant says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The new covenant says, I will bring my people into their land and they will have rest forever. It's the reason why when John sees uh, the new heavens the new earth. I see the new Jerusalem and I see the new heavens and the new earth. It's a reason why Jesus says I'm making all things new. You get the point. The point that the Old Testament is making is the old stuff will not save. We are in desperate need of something, of someone radically new, and it comes to us in Jesus Christ. I'm making it all new. He says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. The one who created the world, I will create for them the new heavens and the new earth. The one who who needs perfect obedience, I can give it, daddy. I can give it to you, says Jesus, to his son. The one who says, I will die for their sins. I will be the great high priest who will offer atonement for their sins, and it will be my own life. He says, every single thing that you need, I'm going to give it to you because I'm that worthy and I'm that able, right? And so I don't know if you've watched uh, Nutty Professor (laughs) or Coming to America. Both movies kind of work. Here's what they have in common. And in Coming to America, Eddie Murphy, he plays four different characters. He's like Prince Akeem. He's like the guy who dances with your soul glow. He's like the guy in the barbershop. He's like the white guy who likes this uh, other Italian boxer that, that when you watch the credits roll at the end, you see all these faces. You're like, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy. Then you watch the, the, you watch, uh, the clumps, right? You know, he's like everybody at the table. He just has on makeup. He's just playing a different role. And here's the point. One man, is that sufficient? Like he is saying, I can be that and I can be that and I can be that and I can do that. I can get into this character. I can get into that character. I can do this. It's the same way at the clump table. He says, I'm Mama Clump, right? Here's the point of the Bible. The point of the whole Bible is Jesus Christ is the main character. He says, you need a new temple? I'm the new temple. You need a new land? I'm going to build that too. You need a new priest? I'm the new priest. When the credits roll for the gospel, when time is over, the star of the show is not a man. It's the God man. He's playing all the roles. He's going to fulfill all the promises. And he's going to make sure all the blessings of the new covenant 
are yours forever. That's how the Bible is working. We're not going to be saved because of our efforts or our righteousness or our obedience. It's not good enough. It's not consistent enough. We're going to be saved by God's grace alone through the work of Jesus alone. Only his hands and his presence and his being can do this, period. Period. That's why we sing of his praises. Who else do we praise? That's why we make much of him and our worship. Who else do we worship? Our Father, Son, and Spirit. That we're saved by them. They do the work. And we rest by faith in what they have done. That's the happy ending. The happy ending to Nehemiah is the ministry and person and work of Jesus who's a better high priest. He says, come to me. He's a better builder. He says, rest in me. He's a better obeyer. He says, get my righteousness. He's a better taker of wrath. He says, put it on me. That the point of the end of Nehemiah is Jesus is always better. Jesus is always sufficient. And the call for us is to rest. And so that's all I have. I think the Bible ends on such a low note here in Nehemiah to make a really high note about the sufficiency of Jesus. I want us to rest in that. Amen? Amen. All right, let me pray for us. Father, we uh, bow before you now. We thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus. We do have a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. He tells us to come. We do have a high priest who has made intercession for us, his very own life. He tells us to come. We do have a high priest who says, I am making all things new. We do have a builder. We do have a city. And its builder and maker is Jesus. Father, I pray that all of our thoughts and all of our desires would find their ways back to the cross of Christ and that we would rest and worship and trust you right there. I pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen.